Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's event. Uh, you will all be put on mute um, as we listen to our speakers, but you will have a chance to speak in our discussion groups a little later. Uh, we're going to wait a couple of minutes before we get started uh, for any other people who would like to join us. Hello everyone, uh, we are about to get started, um, but we've decided to save our chat box just for the questions for our speakers later on. I know everyone likes to kind of greet each other and say goodbye, but let's just save it for the questions um, that we'll, uh, we'll have a selection of those a bit, a bit later. So good evening and welcome to our online discussion. Let's talk about race. Uh, my name's Reverend Kate Dean and I'm, a min I'm the Minister of Roslyn Hill Chapel in Hampstead. It's really wonderful to see so many people joining us this evening and um, I think it's going to be a very thought-provoking discussion. I hope you can handle the heat and that you have your water glass with you as we move through the next couple of hours. We've really got a packed programme so we've got a lot to get through and we're going to get started as people arrive. We have four wonderful speakers um, and then there'll be a chance for you to consider um, a specific question in our discussion groups um, related to the subject of um, racism in some breakout rooms a little later. We'll um, gather together again after that to, um, to hear from each of those breakout groups before concluding with a case study from one of our Unitarian chapels about its recent work in this area um, and some closing words. I want to take this opportunity in advance uh, to thank not only our wonderful speakers, but all of those who have uh, volunteered to facilitate and take notes in our breakout rooms, and especially um, to my, uh, my co-host, Winnie Gordon. I wouldn't have been able to organise this without you and our tech support, Rory. Thank you so much. Now, although I have mixed heritage, I'm certainly no expert on race or racism. I grew up in a very white rural county of Somerset, uh, one of only a handful of non-white pupils in my secondary school. I recognise that I have benefited from certain white privileges, but I've also experienced racism. I am not an expert, but like many other people, I've been moved to act following the news of yet another black man being killed by a police officer in America and by the disproportionate number of black and people of colour affected by the coronavirus. I have been moved by the large number of people protesting and the sense that people are actually listening to the protests. This feels like it could be a turning point, a recognition that black lives really do matter. But then there have been many other situations in the past which were similar. 
It feels like it could be a turning point, but only if ordinary people like ourselves educate ourselves and hold political leaders to account. So this evening is part of my education and I hope it will be part of yours too. We need to educate ourselves so that we can understand more about racism, more about white supremacy systems and white privilege as well. Now of course we're not going to learn it all in this one session or by reading just one good book or having one enriching conversation. Uh, racism has evolved over lifetimes of ra racialization, racially oppressive uh, words and actions, and lifetimes of behavior. It starts with behaviors which can be internalized and externalized by people over generations, and then it is constituted into systems of oppression. But this event is just a start, and we hope that it will open up many more conversations in the future. So before we begin, um, a reminder, if it were needed, that this is a difficult subject and some comments may stir up very strong emotions. We are here to listen to each other, an open-hearted discussion, and we recognise that there will be many different viewpoints. So please be respectful of each other's views, um, that this is a discussion and not a debate. If you find that you have been particularly affected by uh, this evening's event and need to talk to someone about it, we have a pastoral support team available in the next week, in the coming week, and I'll tell you a bit more about their role towards the end of the evening. We also need to be aware that we have participants from many different backgrounds, and here I'm thinking of our friends who are not Unitarian. We know we have lots of Unitarians, we, we have lots of other people of other faiths and um, other beliefs and backgrounds as well, and it's great to see all of you. So every one of us needs to take care that we don't use internal language um, from our own setting as it may not be understood by everyone. And finally, we do invite questions for the speakers and we'll have a short time uh, towards the end to explore a selection of them. So please put any questions that you have in the chat box um, at any time up until when we start the Q&A. Um, but please don't use the chat box for any side conversations. We'd really like to practice some deep listening this evening. So we focus on what people are saying rather than having um, extra debates in the chat box. I know that many of you will have been doing your own reading, your own research already, uh, but some may come to this discussion without any particular knowledge. So we thought it would be a good idea to give um, a definition of racism so that we can that when we talk about racism, we recognise that it is a system, um, a power structure. The term racist is often thrown around, especially on social media. Um, and so let's start with this definition of racism before we hear our first speaker. So this is a quote taken from the book White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. To understand racism, we need to first distinguish it from mere prejudice and discrimination. Prejudice is pre-judgment about another person based on the social groups to which that person belongs. Prejudice consists of thoughts and feelings, including stereotypes, attitudes and generalizations that are based on little or no experience and then are projected onto everyone from that group. All humans have prejudice, we cannot avoid it. Now later D'Angelo writes, discrimination is action based on prejudice. This action includes ignoring, exclusion, threats, ridicule, slander and violence. When a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism. This authority and control transforms individual prejudices into, a far, into far reaching systems that no longer depend on the good intentions of individual actors. It becomes the default of the society and it is reproduced automatically. Racism is a system. 
And so we now move on to our first speaker, Margaret Perry. Margaret is a long-term member of Roslyn Hill Unitarian Chapel, and she's a pillar of our spiritual community, and she's one of the chapel's elders. Margaret has had a long career in education and she, is still, and she still teaches music. She's going to give a personal story of, her personal story of white supremacy systems or why I never learned about Liverpool's historic connection to slavery. So I hand over to Margaret now. Good evening. I remember a shocking lunch hour incident in the northwest city of Liverpool when I was 17. Seven years after the arrival of Empire Windrush in 1948, I was working for the Liverpool Shipping Company of Messrs Thomas and John Brocklebank, located in the iconic Cunard building by the River Mersey. We heard that archive material was to be on public display in the grand building of Picton Library. Knowing nothing about the company's history and ever curious, I dedicated one lunchtime to the library visit. I went alone without prior knowledge or preparation. 40 minutes later, I was profoundly shocked. What I saw in that 40 minute visit were images that became lodged in my head forever. Amongst handwritten columns of figures on parchment, there were also meticulously drawn diagrams showing how the ship's cargo and commodities were to be stowed. They showed how decks would be packed full, especially at night, where nine foot barricade walls would be built. The minute amount of space to be allocated to each commodity and the positioning of manacles. These are two metal bands joined by a chain for fastening on a person's hands or ankles. The commodities indicated as drawings were 500 Africans being transported in a specially designed slave ship to be sold in the Americas. I don't remember talking about that startling lunch hour experience, but I do remember the feeling of deep shame, guilt even, that I experienced immediately, not only in connection with Messrs Thomas and John Brocklebank, but by association with my city and its inhuman past. I didn't stay in that shipping company after that. So that's the story, and this is the question. How did I get to 17 without even a single inkling of that evil aspect of Liverpool's mercantile past? By the age of 17, in 1955, it's reasonable to feel that I should have known in general terms that the prosperity of that city where I was born was closely linked to the profits from the lucrative slave trade but I didn't know. That prosperity of Liverpool with its civic pride and is expressed in grand 19th century Greco-Roman architecture like St George's Hall, Walker Art Gallery, the Law Courts, Picton Library. Industrial development in that Northwest area was underpinned by the profits of slavery. The development of the early railways in the North slate mining in Snowdonia, the cotton industry, sugar refining in the Northwest Britain and the Midlands during the Industrial Revolution were linked to the profitable trade. Soon after that lunchtime visit, I started to try to make up for my total ignorance. No internet then. I did begin to plug gaps. I learned, for example, that Liverpool was called the slavery capital of Britain. In a 300 year period, three quarters of all the slave ships left from Liverpool with trinkets for bartering. It was an international trade and 46% of the entire slave trade was located in Liverpool. So one in eight of Liverpool's population depended on that trade. 
I learned that the first records of slaving activity were dated 1699. The Act of Abolition was 1807 and implemented by 1833. Compensation to owners was calculated. I learned that during the six week middle passage at sea, death and disease was rife. One third of the Africans died en route from disease and cruelty. Seamen, the crew, also died. There are many, many more atrocities which could have been included. Finally, I learned that the financial gains of the slave trade went hand in hand with furthering Britain's colonial expansion. The legacy of both slavery and colonialism is racism and discrimination. The Black Lives Matter movement has prompted wider discussion about Britain's colonial past. It has also raised fundamental questions about the teaching of history. My 17 year old self began to be aware of these themes. Since 1955 and particularly in the 1980s, I know that vital and worthwhile educational thinking has happened and some effective educational strategies are in place. It can never be enough, I think. So it seems that the task is to remain vigilant for all generations and not to stop asking the question, how do we effectively, and that's the word, effectively teach anti-racism so that education by shock, as in my case, can be replaced by wiser methods and strategies. Thank you so much, Margaret. You're welcome. Our next, uh, our next speaker is Gary Stewart. We're delighted to have Gary with us uh, today. Um, Gary is the director of Recognise Black Heritage and Culture, and his organisation began by spreading word uh, about events that celebrate positive experiences of black people within the UK to counteract the pre prevailing negative in images that are in the main dominant. And over the years, Recognise has been involved with a plethora of successful projects, but with its core remaining uh, the central point, which is Gary's life work, which is to promote positive diversity by educating people about the heritage and culture of the Afri African Caribbean community. So thank you, Gary, for coming to us. We'll, uh, you'll be speaking about um, the history of being black in the UK and sharing some of the negative portrayal of black history, but also some positive examples. Over to you, Gary. Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? <laughs> What is supposed to wave, say yes, <laughs> we've got to get animated, thank you everybody. <laughs> Makes me feel a bit better. So first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to start off with a really, con uh, really funny thing to say. The history I'm about to share with you, I'm going to contradict myself. Some of you may know better than me, some of you may not. But the stories I'm going to share is how it's portrayed about black history and the Windrush. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start very quickly about the Windrush itself. So the Windrush is a ship that was due to dock here in 1948. Now, there's lots of stories you're going to hear about the Windrush, but we have to start at the beginning because this is how we get this idea of people misunderstanding immigrants, migrants coming here. If you can imagine in today's world, everybody thinks there were migrants on the boat all stacked up trying to swim the shore to get here. But what we have to remember is the people on that boat, first of all, had paid their way here. Most of them had paid £28. That was the fare at the time to come here. They were all very smartly dressed. They all had businesses, they all had jobs and careers. They were also British citizens. This is one of the issues that we have with races and people think that they were just scroungers from the Caribbean. Every one of them was actually a British citizen because the Caribbean was a British colony. So this is really important for us to understand this point. Second of all, when the ship actually arrived, now we actually celebrate National Windrush Day on the 22nd of June. And this holiday is only three years old, but the Windrush arrived here 72 years ago. So it's taken that long for this to become recognised. The other thing that I want to say as well, that the ship actually arrived the night before. It was actually due to land on the 21st of June. But in Parliament, there was a raging debate 
that to this day, they won't unseal the documents that talks about the Windrush coming. And there was a group of parliament, uh, parliamentarians that were actually, well, in fact, the language is so derogatory, which is why they won't open the actual envelopes with the transcripts in. So as you can imagine, there's these people that have come on the ship, they've been asked to come here, they've been asked to come to rebuild Britain, because Britain obviously was at the end of the war and was struggling. They've all paid their way. Imagine that, you've paid your way to come and help rebuild a country that doesn't want you here. So we start to see this beginning of how we start to see racism against people of colour. Now, we have to go back slightly before, slightly just before that, and talk about the Second World War. Because as most people don't know, that over 6,000 people from the West Indies actually fought in the RAF for Britain during the Second World War. And uh, Kate opened at the beginning talking about racism. One of the ironies, remember I said I was going to contradict myself? One of the ironies is, the Americans who were here practicing Jim Crow during the Second World War used to regularly fight. Their black soldiers were treated under Jim Crow laws from their white Southern soldiers. But when they got here, the British were like, we're not racist, so we don't allow that to go on here. So you would end up with lots of fights between servicemen, which were white American servicemen, fighting with their own black servicemen, with the British servicemen joining in, and the West, Indies, West Indian British, I don't know, you've got to keep up with me, the West Indian British people fighting, so you've got all these people fighting, allegedly, against the Nazis on the other side, now fighting against each other, all because of what racism is. So I just wanted to sort of map that out to show you the backdrop of what we're talking about. And also, when we look at this as well, we saw recently, um, we saw recently the carnage in London a couple of weeks ago with the statue defenders. And it was ironic that there was this racism issue against Black Lives Matter, fight against people that said they wanted to actually fight against defending the statues, making Nazi salutes outside Winston Churchill's statue. So if you can go figure that kind of complicated dynamics, you can understand why we've got racism. And this is also all tied in with the Windrush and the Immigration Acts, which I'm not gonna go into, there's so many, but the Immigration Acts that were actually created to cause this hostility. Now we're just gonna jump forward to 2022, sorry, 2020, not that far, 2020. And what we're going to do is also look, in 2020, we're talking about the Windrush scandal. Quick nod of heads, is everybody familiar with the Windrush scandal? It's been in the news recently, yep, so generally. So we've seen that there's a, a recent report of 30 recommendations, and it's only in the last week, bear in mind we're in 2020, it's only in the last week that the government has now gone back and said that we're actually going to implement all 30 recommendations, one arm twisted behind the back after such a long period of time. So what does that do? That leads me back now to the people, the people who were on the Windrush. And again, as I said to you, they weren't just coming here just to try and find a job. They were invited. Many of them had jobs to go to when they landed here. They actually spread throughout the UK. We've got this idea that everybody went to London and that's why we've got an immigration issue in London. They went as far as Scotland, Telford, Preston, Manchester, Birmingham. And I'm going to talk to you about one passenger in particular that we do know of. Um, which was Lloyd Hilton, and he was the passenger number 680 on the Windrush. Now, an ironic story about Lloyd Hilton is he's a friend of a friend of mine, uh, sorry, he's an uncle of a friend of mine, and he approached me about 10 years ago and said, oh, we do this Windrush celebration, would you enjoy getting involved? And I was like, I don't do Windrush, my history goes right away back to Roman times, because we've got this record of black people being in this country going back to Roman times. And again, it's people understanding British history. We have Black History Month, and we have this sort of, we have this real mixed up idea about what Black History Month is and isn't and why we need it. But if we all just had normal history and Black History, black history was included in normal history, we wouldn't have Black History Month and then we wouldn't have this issue, but then we wouldn't have racism either. So, you know, we can see how we're now able to tie together these reasons. So let's go back to the Windrush. I told you I'm gonna go around the world. Let's go back to the Windrush. So the Windrush came from the Caribbean. It was carrying 492 passengers. But what most people won't tell you, it was actually carrying over a thousand passengers, including the Harris to the Cunard, Cunard shipping line, which most people don't talk about. Also, there were Polish immigrants on there and people from around the world. It stopped off at the actual Caribbean because it was collecting black servicemen who were on leave. So the ship was going to Australia. It dropped off servicemen in the Caribbean, literally said to them, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, enjoy your leave after the end of the war. And also some of those men have been demobbed from the army. So they were still servicemen, but they were coming back to hand in their equipment and leave the services officially. So that's why the ship was where it was and why it came back. Whilst it was there, the British government then decided that it needed help and thought, well, we could actually get people from there to come. And that's why the invitation went out. 
Now, London Transport, everybody knows London Transport. They went out, very large black population on the buses. London Transport actually left here and sent workers out to the Caribbean to actively recruit. The NHS, even though it was just about to be started, also sent people out to recruit. So there was recruiting skilled people to come here on the ship. Now, again, I'm going to jump. So they came, they landed here. The experience that they had, they thought, there's a song, London is the place for me. Does everybody know it? Should we sing it? Okay, <laughs> okay. we can do that later on. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, you know, Lord Kitchen has sung that shop as the ship landed here. And it talked about their experiences. And they thought they were coming to this great Britain that was part of where, you know, they were part of the Commonwealth. You know, they were welcomed here. And when they arrived, the treatment they received was awful. And it's been the case ever since. You know, the youngest person on the ship was 13 years old. A young boy, he came with his uh, adoptive parents. And in the end, during the 60s and 70s, he became a lecturer in London. And one of the things he was still fighting was racism. So imagine, invited here, you get here, you think it's going to be great, and then you're treated so badly. Lord Kitchener song about the song as well. Again, he was, I'm talking about people individually, what he did. He got here, he was a singer. He became a very known clip singer. In fact, everybody plays that song today. And if you watch any Windows program, I'll bet you 20 pounds that that particular song will appear in it. And I can share the details with you afterwards. Again, it talks about women on the ship and what people did. Again, there was a woman on the ship called Mona Baptiste. I'm just flying through these names so you can jot them down and Google them afterwards. Mona Baptiste, she came here, said she was going to be a clerk when she arrived. But little did they know, she was actually a singer from the Caribbean, from Trinidad. Not only did she play the saxophone, but she was a very well-known cabaret singer. She went on to have an amazing career. And what's really bizarre, after being in Britain for a short while, she then decided that she wanted to go to Germany. So you can imagine being black in Germany in the 50s, and we're not quite sure why. But again, she was on the original Windrush. We're looking at, again, people who are skilled. Now, most of the times, just to back it up, when you look at the video footage, uh, sorry, the, the actual film footage that was taken when the ship lands, you generally see men who were dressed quite smart, smartly. They all had a job to go to. Some of them didn't have housing or accommodation, so that's why they were originally held in London. But if you look at all their skills and training, mechanics, remember, a lot of them had been here during the war. So you're looking at mechanics, you're looking at engineers. Imagine being highly skilled and then told when you go to get a job that you don't qualify because of the colour of your skin. Imagine trying to find accommodation. You know, there's lots of hostels and houses. You turn up with your suitcase at the front door. I need a, night, a place to stay. Sorry, no darkies allowed. We've all seen the signs. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And it's really interesting to see that people have real difficulty accepting that. Like, if you treat people in that way when they come here, and it's racism from the beginning, and we're still talking about racism in you know, 2020, it's about understanding what that means, what does racism actually mean? Because some people will say to me, well, you know, things have got better. And I'm like, better for who? Better in, that way, in what way? You know, we look at the generation of Windrush people, and we can take the way, like, we can go right away through the 1960s, the 70s, the 80s. The National Front was a very strong organisation in the 1970s. You know, we have other offshoots, the BMP. We have, um, I mean, we saw what happened in London, as I said before. We have all these offshoots as well. That's the fear that people live with sometimes. And it's no different from the 70s to 2020. I'm quite, I mean, you can't see it. I'm actually six foot. I'm quite well built. I was an ex-soldier myself. You know, I'm not scared to take anybody on, but I still have to be careful what I do when I go into these environments. And, you know, that's somebody that can handle themselves. So imagine young children who have been like this, who were brought up. And each generation from the Windrush thought it was going to be better for their children. That's why they came here. Nobody came here to slouch. They came here because they wanted to work, to build a better life for themselves and other people. And in some cases, that has been denied to them by the whole mafias, by people who do hold racist views for whatever reason, by some people who just have a lack, a lack of understanding. And by some people, that by the very nature, and this is something that we really do need to hold out, by some people who just want to be racist because it suits them to be. And that's a conversation most people don't like to have. And even if you find yourself tripping into a small part of racism, you know, it comes out sometimes for some people, you know, it's, it's, it's in you and you have to be able to address it. Now, what is fantastic, like I said, I've only got a short time, so I'm going to jump now. What was fantastic, the 2012 Olympics, was we got this opportunity to talk about Great Britain and its time. And in that part, they actually showed a sketch of the actual Windrush and they reenacted as part of the opening ceremony. They actually acted out people coming off the Windrush. 
And it was quite interesting. That was a momentous time for us. I was in London at the time myself as an engineer um, working for the Olympics. And it was this, you know, this opening ceremony that showed the best of Great Britain right through time. And I don't know if you can remember the MP that opened with the comment about, oh, let's get this multiculturalism rubbish, is, I'll use the word rubbish, off the TV screen. You know, this was a chance to hold up Britain in its great period of time. And that's an, that's a kind of a particular way that black people feel almost every day, despite doing the best that they want to do, there are people out there that would just not accept them for they are. So moving on very quickly, the Windrush, what did it bring us? It brought us a culture of people. It brought us different foods. It brought people who had a different way of life, people that wanted to integrate, people who were too keen to like show their music, their talents, their skills. There were so many entertainers, so many talents, athletes that you see today. Everybody's from that Windrush generation, even though it is important to stay, there were black people in this country before the Windrush arrived here. Now, remember at the beginning, I told you I was gonna contradict myself. The Windrush actually wasn't the first ship to bring migrants to this country. In the year before, the SS Almazora actually brought some ex-servicemen and people. And there was another ship just before that in 1947 as well, called the SS Ormonde, which also brought people, but they came in under the radar, so people didn't realize. So the Windrush was responsible for bringing the most amount of mass immigration, um, migra migrants into the country. But there were other ships that were coming in before that with just smaller numbers as well. But we're not gonna take the glory away from the Windrush. What we're just doing is highlighting that this isn't an issue just because of the sheer numbers that people then became very touchy about immigration. And if you look back again, we don't have time to do it here, but if you look back again, you will see that there are so many um, immigration bills and laws that were rushed through because the British, despite requiring labor and people to move here, then also created hostile policies to stop them coming here in the first place. So again, it's this contradiction that I'm constantly talking about as well. So, how long do I have left? Sorry. Is everybody bored yet? <laughs> I've got two minutes? Yes, okay. please. Yeah, two minutes, yeah, no problem. So what I'll wrap up to say, there's so much that I want to talk to you about on the Windrush, which is the journey, the ship, the servicemen who were there as well, the women on the ship, the women who brought their children here as well, something like 23 children who were registered on the ship to travel here as well. And, you know, you see these images as well. And we still talk to some of the Windrush generation people. And you also get this really funny contradictory of their experiences where people, some people come and say that they had no problem, they just got on. And people come back and say they had a horrendous time and they had to migrate back to the Caribbean because it was safer for them at the time. So I just ended by saying, there's so much to talk about. I've only just very scraped the surface here about talking about the Windrush and the people that came off it and the skills that we learned and the knowledge that we learned about it as well. And what I will say is, this is a further conversation to have for people to understand what is it in us that makes us so against immigrants coming here who are trying to work, um, work, raise families, just to do something different. And why are they treated so bad and that effect is still going on in 2020. And that's the real key. It's still happening today, 2020. There's so many passengers who actually should have been paid out from the Windrush Compensation Scheme. Uh, there's a program which I will drop called the Sitting in Limbo. I don't know if everybody's seen that, but if you want to understand what the Windrush policy is worth watching that particular program, and that will give you a very clear indication of what happened to those people who came as children on the Windrush, had no papers, the Home Office took their papers and destroyed them, and then they had to then, they were then told that you're actually not a British citizen, you don't belong here. And you can imagine having everything taken away from you. So I shall very, I can see Kate nodding, so I shall end on that note. Would love to stay and talk a lot more about it, but like we probably need an hour. But I thank you very much for your time and listening. Thanks so much, Gary. I'm sorry we had to rush you through. That's given us a really nice taste and hopefully some appetite for learning more about um, Windrush and all of the other um, examples that you've given. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're going to uh, move on now to uh, Reverend Winnie Gordon. Uh, Winnie is Minister at um, Birmingham Edgbaston Unitarian Community um, and also Kidderminster New Meeting House. Uh, she identifies as Black British from a working class upbringing and she was born to middle class multi-ethnicity uh, Caribbean parents who were colonial subjects of the Queen as we've heard um, that arrived in England in the 1950s and 60s with links to European, North American, Jewish and African ancestry. 
both her parents were Christian and Winnie describes herself as a product of colonialism. She is currently studying a master's of research and her topic uh, focus is black inclusivity in Unitarian worship. It has led to much research on racism and Winnie tonight will explore her experience and challenges of being black in a westernized society and the effects it has had on true authenticity. So over to you Winnie. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. I'm going to go straight into it because I know time is short. For black people and people of colour, our identity has been shaped by lifetimes of other people's externalised thoughts and actions, lifetimes of internalised expectations of behaviour and lifetimes of institutional systems that have put forward their expectations of conformity. From the superficial, surface level racial verbal abuse to the deeply embedded structural systems that uplift dominant culture and belittles non-dominant people of colour, racism perpetuates a culture of white superiority of the races and undermines the achievement of other races. Racism is complex and it differs for various groups of people of colour. As such, I will speak here predominantly from the perspective of a person of the black diaspora. So from a young age, black people are taught how they must present themselves in society to overcome many hurdles that many people of the dominant culture never have to even consider. For example, I've heard it said that I got a job because they had to fulfill a quota or a place at university because of affirmative action. Each occasion assumed the person was unworthy, undeserving, uneducated, and strikes at one's self-esteem. It had nothing to do with ability. It was all about the color of the skin. As a child, I didn't consciously think about race until I was eight years old and was called a racist name. I grew up in an area of where there were only two black families on the street and we were one of them. I went to a school with very few black children, no black staff, we had a black and white TV and most of the people in the box were white. The books in the school were all by white authors with white characters and white people on the cover. The newspapers featured mainly white people, white stories of heroism or successes. Occasionally there were pictures which depicted a black footballer. So until the age of eight I thought I was like all the other kids in my social group and they happened to be white. My friends, mostly white, never had to consider that they were a race. They grew up with an attitude and in an atmosphere of white being normal. Black was other. So if black was other, how did I get to a place to be considered normal? Subconsciously, so I must have had some awareness of being different. When kids spoke about what they wanted to do when they grew up, I remember my white friends saying things like astronaut, spy, scientist, policeman, and being encouraged by their teachers. When I said doctor or policeman, I was told I possibly, possibly could be a shopkeeper or work in a factory or maybe even be a nurse. And then I wondered why I and other children with skin colour, dark skin colour, couldn't be whatever we wanted to be. I can remember wishing that when I grew up I could be white, so subconsciously I must have had some awareness of racial difference before I was eight. In countless ways I could see where I encountered subtle, indirect and overt racism and how it has shaped my development and self-concept. I've experienced racism in individual acts of meanness. The words used to describe us have been mainly negative, from the n-word to coloured, which by the way is not an acceptable term. Black, Brown, mixed race, dual race, half caste, again, not an acceptable term. BME to BAME. Each term rarely first checked with us before being assigned. Black, a term I have embraced, also comes with negative association. Black being considered dark, evil, bad, savage, bad luck, dirty, blackmail, blacklist, black, sh black sheep, and so on. Can you imagine how these can hinder the development of a positive self-esteem and self-belief? Words matter. I have seen, as a fellow teacher, 
and personally experienced how racial bias influenced how teachers mark work, how they inter interact with children, punish students, how many strikes a child can have before being expo expelled, usually far less strikes for a black child than a white. Now I'm not talking about every teacher, just some. In Ijoma Aluo's research, when she was writing a book, so you want to talk about race, she gives an example about the use of language to describe a five-year-old child's action. Rather than a simple play rough or hit a person, which is terms I have observed used for white children, this black child was described as violent attacks or assaulted a teacher and should be charged. Hitting is never okay, but the teacher would not have suffered irreparable harm by a five-year-old. But these words and the actions taken could have done irreparable harm to the five-year-old forever. From suspension to expulsion, being taken to the police station to be questioned, loss of school friends, moved to a new school that now has with now a bit bad reputation, dismissed as disruptive, eventually not schooled at all, youth crime to prison. This is not an exaggeration, it happens a lot. Incidentally, while teaching here in England, I had a white 15-year-old student point a gun to my face and nothing was done to that child. Each day, as I left for school, I was warned by my mother to behave, to use an inside voice and not a loud one, so I was not perceived as disruptive, threatening or dangerous. Of course, I forgot, and oftentimes I was told police and was told I was too loud, too angry, too aggressive, and sent to face the wall. Once in a class as a teenager, an RE teacher told me how I descended from savage African slave headruns. Innocently, I tried to explain my Caribbean Christian roots and was called rude for arguing my point. I learned quickly not to participate in slave history sessions. What I really learned was to cater to the white gaze and the sensibilities, and I learned to police both my words and actions, often not responding with my full truth to a situation that would cause discomfort to others. Instead, I internalised my discomfort and my rage. Black parents, now black parents go on and on about the importance of education. Not only were we expected to go to university, but to get there we had to be two times better than our white counterpart work twice as hard, get twice the amount of qualifications. That's because I had two things against me. I was black and I was female. Now, a typical joke in families of colour is when a child comes home with a B grade, all excited and proud, and the parent asks them why they didn't get an A grade. Didn't I tell you that you have to be smarter than everyone else? B is okay, but I expect an A. Now, Layla said, in her book, White Supremacy and Me, says it well, when she tells us her mother was pointing out that in a racist and patriarchal society, I would be treated differently. I would not be rewarded the same for the same efforts. I would need to work harder to compensate for the colour of my skin. Preparing for school or for an interview meant sitting down and straightening my hair, usually chemically, or with a hot iron comb, and both ones meant I got burnt. This was because my natural hair was seen as unemployable, not westernised enough, and made some in the white community uncomfortable, whereas straight hair signalled black people as one of us and non-threatening. It denied me acceptability when wearing my braids or kinky hair. Now, last year, in 2019, my daughter cried daily for three months as her boss bullied her about her hair braids a very specific protective hairstyle need of black women, demanding to change it. And no one stood up with or stood up with my daughter. No one stood up to her manager. And finally, my daughter quit. I've always been proud to be black. My mother instilled in me a black and proud philosophy. Yet many times I have had friends, teachers, employers tell me they don't see me as black. Then what do they see me as? Who am I if I'm not black? Does that mean I'm acting white? What does acting white even mean? And what was wrong with being black anyway? Psychologically, it must do something to the psyche to be denied part of one's identity. 
to be told my skin tone does not exist, nor does my hair texture or my culture practices or my ancestry or history. My parents, my brother, my relatives have all had that talk with me, that stop and search. What to do, how to speak, how to, who to call if you're arrested. I was told because I was black to be expected to have stop and search multiple times because many of my family were to never resist, to always be polite, to not ask questions, to do as I was told, to survive for another day. I was taught that if I was stopped while driving, to keep my hands on the steering wheel until told not to, to follow the instructions of the police officer exactly, repeating what I am doing as I do it, to keep to the main roles if I was stopped so there'd be witnesses. The message that the police may be, may be a source of potential danger. Now I've been stopped while driving, once because I was speeding and I was given a speeding ticket. Another time, I don't know why I was stopped, I was in a nice neighbourhood with an old car. And then at that time I was delivering newspapers. Another time I was stopped, I was in a nice car. That time I was working for a car rental place. Ijoma Oluo tells us, we are, each and every one of us, a collection of our lived experiences. Our lived experiences shape us, how we interact with the world and how we live in the world. Our experiences are valid. What I have come to realise is that my own silence, my complacency, my lack of awareness, my lack of challenge has contributed to the perpetuation of this system and hidden my authentic self. I have subconsciously become complicit in the system of my own struggle for identity and brought into this white supremacist system, the right of dominance through my acquiescence to it. If I can't beat it, join them. That's been my attitude. But it's robbed me of a rich heritage, of practices and traditions, of learning more oral history, because as black people, we've been taught to conform to white norms. Professor of Law and Theologian Paul Razor argues that the evil of white racism lies deeper than the institutional structures and systemic power relations. It has a spiritual dimension that has grown in the complacency of the liberal tendencies to be accommodating rather than prophetic and offering critique of culture. I have experienced invisibility in offering critique of culture and denial of racism in the collective response of power. Professor and theologian James Cohn suggests that it is the power positions that encourage those marginalised to white mask as they attempt to be as their oppressor. This highlights the struggle, the duality that exists within black folks and black folks exist within. All of this has impacted in hindering people of colour and black people from being and the discomfort of living their authentic self. In reflection on the 1950s work of Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask, the sense of betrayal and white folks refusal of non-acceptance of black folks, the othering, the stereotyping and made to feel as if on display, the split of the psyche into the other are implied in personal accounts of exclusion expressed, racism felt, harm done to people of colour in today's England. Black people have had to change who they are. They've masked their behaviours, their thoughts and not spoken their words. It's time that this stops. If I'm never allowed to be me, to explore my heritage, to let my true self come out, to live free, how can you ever say you know me? How can you ever feel safe with me? How can you ever be my brother or my sister? How can you call yourself in community with me? So racism is all of our problem as it denies us all the opportunity to explore and live out our authentic self. It denies us a community that covenants to love each other as ourselves, give each other respect and honour the worth and dignity of each other. So let's do better. Let's be our authentic self. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Winnie. You've given us plenty of food for thought and I really hope that we can um, continue to explore this in the future, but certainly in our discussion groups. Thank you. It's really powerful. Our third speaker, uh, no, our fourth speaker is um, Dr. Judy Ride. Uh, she's a psychotherapist and a member of the Bath Unitarian Fellowship. Uh, she is also the author of White Privilege Unmasked, um, and has researched the issue of white privilege extensively. She has a special interest in working with difference in psychotherapy um, and she completed a PhD at Bath University entitled Exploring White Racial Identity and its Impact on Psychotherapy and Psychotherapy Organisations. So it's not surprising that we've brought her here today to speak to us about recognising white privileges in our own lives. Over to you Judy. Well, <clears throat> fantastic to be here to, and ask to do this. Um, and what powerful speeches we've heard already. Um, and they, they speak to something, some of the things that I'd like to say or illustrate some of the things I'd like to say. Um, you heard just now that I researched um, whiteness uh, at university at, uh, for, for a PhD and when I first did when I first went to the university what I thought I was going to research was race and people said to me well why are you doing that you know you're you're white it's not your business what are you doing and so I thought well it seems to me that that white people must be part of the racial scene and I will therefore concentrate on whiteness and try and investigate that. So, um, uh, so the first thing that happened when I tried to investigate it was that I couldn't see it. It was as if I was looking at nothing. It was like opening a book and finding no words on the page. And um, that was quite, quite something to stay with because I realized that that wasn't right. But I started reading around the subject of whiteness. Um, and one of the things that, that people said was um, that white people who are white regard themselves as normal, as somebody, one of the other speakers said, um, that one is normal and the others, non-white people, sort of deviate from normality. So it, it, you know, so looking at whiteness was like looking at nothing. And that was um, quite something. But as I started to look, it was as if something started emerging from that white page and I began to be able to see it. And I began also to see the privilege that white people have in their apparent normality. Um, and so I began to research, you know, the history of, um, of, of whiteness and the history of uh, different races coming to this country um, to, um, and America. And I've written about that in my book, White Privilege Unmasked. I've written another one as well called Being White in the Helping Professions, if anyone's interested. Um, so, um, uh, I get quite a lot of kickback from people because I'm, I write about this subject. It's like people think I'm obsessed with something. And I must say that I'm beginning to feel a bit vindicated now because at last this is a subject that people actually recognise as a bona fide subject. <clears throat> um, so my books are suddenly doing a lot better, which is amazing. <laughs> I never really expected that. Uh, but with Black Lives Matter, I think there's some way in which it's actually getting under the skin of white people, as well as being a good rallying call for, um, for black people. And people are beginning to become curious about uh, what it is to be white and what privileges people have as white. And one of the, the other kickbacks I get is people say, well, I'm not privileged. You know, I was brought up really poor. We didn't know where our next meal was coming from or, or something. And there are lots of black people who, um, 
you know, and lawyers and doctors and, you know, etc. And so my answer to them is that, um, that there are a lot of ways of not being privileged, but being not white is certainly one of the most important differences. And part of the reason why it's so important is that it's so apparently unrecognized. Um, because people just don't see um, how they're, um, they're uh, that they are in fact racist. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, you know, I believe in equal opportunities and, you know, I, 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 I don't, I'm not racist. I don't um, do racist things and so on. Um, but that's rubbish. Almost, I would say that every white person is racist and has racist thoughts. And sometimes I run workshops where I encourage people to actually catch their racist thoughts. And that's not easy to do. It's very uncomfortable. People really don't like being asked to do this. And, and when I've asked them to do it and I help them through it, they'll often um, come back with um, uh, some kind of outrage at racism or something. And I'm saying, no, I'm asking you about your racism. <laughs> I'm asking you for your racist thoughts. And, and gradually people can get it, you know. Ah, oh, yes, I do. You know, it's as if a thought kind of flashes through the mind like that and then, you know, bat, bat it away. I'm talking now, of course, of people who aren't sort of out and out racist, but uh, sort of liberal minded people that um, uh, feel that they, you know, feel they're not racist and, uh, you know, are on the side of the angels sort of thing. Um, and of course that can apply to a lot of Unitarians, I expect most Unitarians would say they were not racist. Um, but of course our attitude to our whiteness is based on an incredible history of racism and of benefiting by racism, of benefiting absolutely majorly by um, the exploitation of black people as we've heard already today. Um, and certainly Unitarians have been part of that um, um, exploitation of black people and um, living off slavery and so on. And the, the wealth that we see today was originated from those times, colonial times, where people made enormous sums of money um, through um, through slavery. So, um, you know, we can't be holier than thou. Um, our own communities are built on slavery. Um, and I discovered in my researches that someone that Unitarians hold dear, Ralph Waldo Emerson, was incredibly racist. I mean, in his diaries, the things he wrote about black people are absolutely shameful. In spite of the fact he was against slavery, he spoke against slavery, he was nevertheless extremely racially prejudiced. Um, so, um, I'm not, you know, I don't want to just berate white people. It is very difficult. We all, um, we all, uh, we were all born into this systemic situation, um, but we need to recognize that we are also still benefiting by um, the race, our racist past. And we are still influenced by the racism that our forebears had. Um, even if we try not to, there they are often um, racist thoughts und under the surface and, the, and they come out in ways that black people, as we have heard, will recognize. They'll recognize the subtle ways in which white people um, uh, hold underlying racist ideas and relate to black people differently to white people. Um, I don't know, um, Kate, I wonder whether it's possible, or is it Rory, to show a, sli a slide that I sent? I don't know if you got it. 
I don't think I received a, a, a slide. You uh, you, do you only have a minute or so to wrap up, I'm afraid, Judy? Oh, right, okay. I was going to show um, uh, a slide of ways in which I benefit, I myself benefit by being white. Um, uh, there's someone called Peg Peggy McIntosh thought of 46 ways in which she benefited by being white. And uh, that's quite a challenge to come up with 46. So I encourage you all to think of the ways in which you benefit by being white. And I'll just give you one as an example. I go to pick up my grandchildren from school. Um, well, I used to before lockdown. And um, uh, nobody looks at me as if there's something odd about me coming to pick up my children, my grandchildren. Um, there's, but there's a way in which the black people that come to pick up their children are kind of viewed differently. You can see it in how people relate to them and attitudes to them. So that's just one example, but there are a load of ways that you, you, know, you could think of if you try. So anyway, I better finish there. I think I've had my time, have I? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, another um, opportunity for us to really think um, in depth into um, that subject of white privilege. And of course, we could talk all, all night just about that one particular one. But we're, we're just at the starting point, folks, um, of this discussion. Um, and we're going to go into our breakout groups now. Uh, we've got 12 breakout groups and each will be discussing a different question. Um, so in a moment, I'll, um, you'll be invited to join a breakout group. Um, each will have a facilitator and a note taker. Uh, or a harvester who's going to gather the responses and magically craft them um, into a response for, for the wider group when we come back. You're only going to have this 15 minutes, um, which means each person will probably only get a minute or so to speak, uh, to share your view, but hopefully there'll be a little time towards the end um, of your session um, to kind of come to a consensus and hear what the note taker has, has come up with. So please remember to be um, respectful when you speak and give other people the chance to speak um, when your time is up. Uh, this is an opportunity to explore all of these wide ranging issues in a very limited time and it is um, an opportunity to share your views. So again, not a debate, um, please just keep practicing that deep listening. Um, and um, and enjoy the, the, the conversations. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do put them in the chat box and I'll ask uh, Rory to open up our, um, our sessions, our breakout sessions. It's always such a relief to see that people manage to ping back into the main room after we've all gone off to our uh, our various breakout rooms. So, phew, thank goodness. It's so lovely to see you all again. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It was probably a, a whistle-stop tour. Um, I'm just going to ramble for a few seconds to let our note takers um, uh, have a think about what they're going to say. Um, basically, what I propose doing is I'm going to read the question um, and then I'll ask each note taker in turn um, to give their response from their from their group. Um, and again, if you have uh, questions for um, for our speakers, then please put them in the chat box. I'm monitoring that as we go along. So we're going to start with my group, which is group one. Um, and here's the question from group one. And then um, Kate, Kate McKenna, Brady McKenna will um, respond. So question one is, Judy suggests our attitudes about race are shaped by the attitudes and assumptions of those around us or our immediate or and extended family, our immediate and wider community. Where and how do you feel your attitudes and assumptions regarding race have been shaped and formed and name some examples. Over to you, Kate. Oh, is she unmuted? There we go, sorry, I couldn't. Yeah. Uh, we had a very wide discussion. I've struggled to encapsulate it. We all seem to swim in waters in which racism, whether that's over or covert and major aggressions or microaggressions is shockingly normal. Uh, 
some of us are the beneficiaries of that, many of us aren't, uh, but the waters are, the waters seem very racist. Mm. If I've let my group down, I apologise. Thank you. No, I think that's that's helpful. We yes, it was wide ranging, but um, we we got the gist from that. Thanks a lot. So let's move on to question two, um, which is uh, and and our note taker is Michael Allurid. So be be ready, Michael. Um, question two: We are all vulnerable about our own bias and knowledge gaps. Is it it's okay to be uncomfortable with that as it leads to personal growth? What are some of our unconscious, conscious and unconscious biases? So a question about conscious and unconscious biases. Michael? Thank you. Well, I don't, I don't pretend to have crafted a beautiful sentence or, or two, but um, what, what I've written down from the discussion is, is that conscious and unconscious bias is difficult um, to recognise um, in many ways. One form of unconscious bias um, that we talked about was being extra nice to people who we perceived as, as different because they might be, you know, in our heads, more needy. And there are often um, feelings of fear and trepidation in those who are perceived as different um, either because of, for example, how they dress or because we perceive certain behaviours that are attributed to those groups because of the way in which we receive those perceptions from society. Thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, moving on to question three, I think Helen was the note taker, the harvester for this. Um, question three, how much do we understand our own privileges? How may we unknowingly benefit from being white or being disadvantaged by being a pers person of colour? Um, so Helen isn't here. Ah, okay. Um, so I've unmuted uh, Judy, who was in that group as well, in the hope that somebody else took on that role. Okay, doke. Okay. Is that who you're referring to? Yes, yes <laughs> you, right, I sorry. Was in group. I was sent to group 10. I tried to send a thing oh. on the... So, oh. um, that group... I, That's tricky. That group neither me nor Helen, so I don't know how that went. Ah, uh, they may not have got the question in that case. Um, can I yeah. ask group, um, if you were in room three, could you wave your hand and perhaps just give us a gist of, uh, of what you discussed, please? Um, I don't know if there's a way of unmuting someone who's waving their hand right now. There's so many of you. Rory, help me out with this. <laughs> Dot, is, uh, Dot, are you yeah. waving your hand? Thank you. I was asked on the last minute to go and scribe um, but uh, we got into group three, we didn't have a facilitator or a question. Mm. Oh dear. Um, so I did, I tried to describe what we did. There were three things I think that stood out. Uh, one was a question, should we uh, distinguish between race and culture? Uh, the second thing was fear of people engaging in discussions like this in case we say the wrong thing mm -hmm. and we looked at the difference between if we say the wrong thing or we do the wrong thing and we acknowledge that and say you know please help me i think i did it wrong i said it wrong um and learn from it is very different from saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing and not caring and that led us to say the importance of openness to engage um, and to forgive those mistakes, us, our own and others, in order to be able to have an open dialogue um, and, and learn from that. So I think, I, I hope I've captured the main things that came out of that group. Um, 
but it was uh, it was a very last minute. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Thank Thank you so much for, for your flexibility. Um, we're going to move on and I'll ask our, um, our note keepers to keep up the pace as we have quite a few questions to get through. Um, so uh, question four was around um, our systems being steeped in white whiteness centred culture from the history we're taught, the books we read in school, curriculum in our education system, the majority majority films that locate the white person as the hero, the, and um, the CEOs of Fortune 500 com companies. So back to Margaret's question, how do we effectively teach mm -hmm. anti-racism so that education by shock, as was in her case, uh, is replaced by wiser methods? So I think that was Eleanor Hopefully, yes. if that works. We're going to go to Bob Janice Dillon because oh, okay. we've lost Eleanor. Fine. Go, go, Bob. go for it, Bob. Thank you. We, we had a very uh, wide ranging discussion and we, we, we talked specifically or particularly from uh, anti-racist uh, education from a white, white perspectives in, in this group. And we said one of the important things was from white perspectives to, to be willing to sort of shut up and listen was the phrase, you know, and be able to, to, to listen to the voices of people of, of color um, and, and decenter ourselves and decenter our, our, our perspective. Um, at the same time, we said we lifted up that it's not the job of, of people of color to teach us as white people um, about our own prejudice and our own racism, that really we have to do that educating and we need to do that um, learning. And we talked about a wide variety of different ways of, of creating anti-racist society from, from the educational, the films, TED Talks, reading, cultural experiences, but also experiences and exposure, actually sort of being in amidst and creating those sort of multicultural settings that challenge the kind of us, them, that us versus them dynamics that often come up. Um, so that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Very succinct, Bob. Thank you. We'll move on to question five. Um, and this was um, a question about the Colston statue um, with Jim Corrigal as the note taker um, and Michael as the, Michael Dyson as the facilitator. With the recent removal of the Colston statue, can you name any statues that tell, um, that provide uh, black people as a hit, that will provide black people with a hero? Can you name any that make black people uncomfortable? So, yeah, yeah, Jim, yeah absolutely. Well, we discussed uh, several statues. We discussed several existing statues, uh, which are clearly positive and um, do provide examples of heroes. Uh, Nelson Mandela, um, Mary Seacole, and in, uh, Noor Inyat Khan, uh, the uh, Second World War hero. Um, who was also a Sufi, uh, it came from a great Sufi lineage. And uh, so that was expressed as well, the, uh, the, um, uh, the spiritual dimension there. Uh, then we also discussed people we think should be, uh, there should be statues of uh, Dame Kelly Holmes, uh, Arthur Watson, the first black footballer in Britain, uh, um, and um, Mo Farah and Muhammad Ali. So these were ideas uh, as well, and of, of, of positive black representatives. Uh, the only negative that was proposed, that was specifically mentioned, was Henry Dundas in Edinburgh, who uh, helped delay the abolition of slavery and also was a slave owner himself, and a, a very tall statue. Um, we did think it was significant that we found it difficult to name um, uh, negatives. That we found it difficult to kind of come up with who would be, uh, who, you know, there must be so many statues that will make black people feel uncomfortable. And yet that was one, uh, that was the only one that we came up with. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Um, let's move on to question six. This was um, Sue Woolley as the note, note taker. Um, thinking about some of the misconceptions and stereotypes associated with people of colour, how can you help someone see their racism without offending them? And I should say um, this came up in our group as well um, and so we would be very interested to hear your, your views on this. So go ahead Sue. Yeah, 
Well, again, I, we, I'm not sure we were convinced it was possible um, and that we should be prepared to have difficult and uncomfortable conversations and to recognise our own racism. Uh, we agreed that it was important to challenge people about racist comments and ask them to imagine what it would be like to be discriminated against because of something you cannot help. And that the important thing was to get to know people as people, regardless of their ethnicity. Um, there, were, there were other things said, but I think I'm low on time. So, Thank you for that succinct answer. Thanks a lot, Sue. On to question seven, this is um, uh, Laurie Winters with The Note Taker and the question is, what does racism entail? How is it possible that no one claims to be racist, yet racism still exists? Over to you, Laurie. Yes, thank you, Kate. Um, we started off talking about how um, racism um, uh, exists deep into culture and systems and we were talking about um, the source of it um, being in um, sort of primal fears of difference and um, uh, the tendency to tribalism and demonizing. Um, and then also um, people very much were curious about um, the source of racism in their own lives and um, the fact that, I mean, they, we looked at it in quite a personal way um, and, and the thought that we don't always recognize it in ourselves. Um, and yet I would say quite a widespread cur genuine curiosity about investigating the, the sort of the ways of privilege in our own, in our own lives. I think that that sort of curiosity has been very much awakened. And, um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Laurie. Um, on to question number eight. This was James Chiron Kandath. Um, and the question is saying that one is colorblind can make it difficult to address unconscious ideologies. Why is this and what can be done about it? Over to you, James. Hey, um, thank you. I think we all thought that the term colorblind is unhelpful because it is basically false. Uh, and it erases not only the other's identity, but also your own. And, um, and it also uh, makes it impossible to address the racism that exists in society. So how do we deal with this? I think uh, a number of people made this point in different ways, that it's important to find the language uh, to address that that support that supposed color blindness, uh, but to also be sensitive to find the vocabulary uh, to to address it, and uh, and because sometimes of course when people say that they are color blind, they might be trying to say that they are not racist. But it just comes out in that way. So we need to be sensitive in how we address it and we need to find the language and that depends on the people and the context. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, James. Um, on to question nine. I think this was Stephanie Bisbee as the uh, note taker. Question nine. In the discussion of race, what is meant by saying black lives matter instead of all lives matter and why? We thought that it matters to say black lives matter because now and for the last 400 years since colonial times, African and colonial lives haven't been treated by those in power as if they matter, almost as if there's an unspoken as well or as much after Black Lives Matter, which is something that the world should not need to be told, but it does. Structurally, black representation has been missing. We're seeing disproportionate effects of COVID in black and minority ethnic communities. We're seeing people being treated differently, even in everyday situations. And so we need to show that Black Lives Matter, because for so long in so many ways our society has been saying they don't. Mm. Thank you so much, Stephanie. 
Um, on to question 10, um, and this is, um, I think Liz Slade was the note taker. Some people think racism is not a white problem. What's your view? Well, we were all agreed that it is a white problem, um, but it's also, you know, it's everybody's problem. It's a collective problem. Um, we recognise that white people created racism um, and the myth of white supremacy. Um, and so white people need to be part of, um, of, of addressing that. Of, um, and we also recognise how that racism has been baked into our culture um, through our institutions, through our history, and um, and we're still living among things that, you know, racist ideas that were that sort of shaped our culture a long time ago. Um, and we also recognise that the importance of white, the, the issue being resolved by white people, but in a way that doesn't carry on centering white power, uh, making sure that it is in, in dialogue with people of colour. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, on to question 11. This is um, Angela Dobson is the note taker. What can be done to correct white culture and imbalanced views of people of culture so that they won't affect future generations? Um, right, so we, we thought basically, going back to Blair's comment, but mention, education, 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 but actually re-education, 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 relearning about history, history from a broader perspective, so not about white dominions, uh, but and um, one potent comment agreeing with when, w Winnie's comments uh, it's the not, not the duty of black people to re-educate white people uh, because they've spent so much time integrating sort of lost the path of themselves it's actually the duty of white people to re-educate themselves. Very good point Angela thank you. Um, and last but not least question 12 this was um, Colleen Burns as the note taker and it goes like this everyone has their biases um, prejudices consist of thoughts feelings stereotypes etc and is the prejudgment of another based on social groups to which that person belongs discrimination is action based on prejudice and that's a, qu a quote from Robin DiAngelo how then would you define racism in the light of that definition of prejudice um, and discrimination over to you, Colleen. Yeah, so we concluded that it has to do with power. Um, the, there's a, one of the things that came up was there's a difference between ignorance and racism. So curiosity or rudeness about differences such as hair and skin, that's ignorance. But racism has to do with power and with, um, with systems. It, it allows white people, racism allows white people and white institutions to retain the power that they have. And then as a kind of as an aside, uh, lumping people together as B-A-M-E or even now as B-A-M-E-R, including refugees in with B-A-M-E, takes away, takes away culture and background and puts all diversity into one category. Um, and then we talked a little more about how uh, re reverse racism cannot exist. I mean, that, that's a phrase that some people use, but it's not possible for that to exist because racism is structural and because you cannot be racist against the power structures and the people who are in power. Thank you. That's wonderful concluding remarks. Um, I hope you enjoyed those discussions. As you can imagine, we are running um, a bit later than um, planned. Uh, so we're going to continue on now um, with, oh, I think we have enough questions for our Q&A, which may well run over nine o'clock, but I won't be offended if you have to leave early. Um, but we're going to hand over now um, to hear from um, our friends at uh, Cross Street Chapel. This is Reverend Cody Coyne, the minister at Cross Street um, and the, um, the chair of the congregational committee, Adam O'Leary Ampersar, who are going to talk to us um, about their new initiative, um, and hopefully it give us inspiration of what we can do in our communities. So handing over to Cody and Adam now. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, so Cross Street issued a statement uh, within, a, it was a few weeks after, after the death of George Floyd, 
Um, we've made statements in the past um, on sort of various social issues, I think most notably after the Manchester uh, attack uh, several years ago. And uh, Manchester has such a, has a very a vibrant sort of interconnected civic and religious uh, network of communities. Um, we know that it's, it's far from perfect and that there is um, a great deal of both systemic and aggressive uh, racism that exists within the city as well. Uh, but when we came to issuing our statement and thinking about what we wanted to say, we felt that just saying something wasn't enough. We wanted to make sure that we're actually making a statement with, uh, with very intense, uh, intent actions, substantive changes uh, that we could make and we could hope uh, to see might influence uh, the city and, and further for the positive. Uh, so we wanted to just share with you a few of those uh, thoughts or a few of the things that we've begun. Uh, one of the very easy, <laughs> relatively, I was going to say easiest measures we can is to revise our worship, to look at how we're, you know, the material that we're using, uh, the range of voices uh, within our readings and prayers, for instance, uh, to see if we're able to include more uh, voices of color. With this, though, and certainly as a white as a white man myself, uh, there is a, a risk of cultural appropriation and appropriating voices, um, using them uh, not for the intent and the purpose that they were written, but you know for something that we've sort of projected their voice onto our meaning. So. As soon as we make that statement about wanting to revise our worship, it instantly makes sure that we have to bring uh, a critical whiteness to us, that we have to be aware that the material we're using, we're using appropriately um, and we're using carefully and authentically. Um, but it seeps not just into the actual material, but we wanted it to address uh, a further, you know, further use. The, uh, there's a great range of uh, what are called sort of liberation theologies that have come out in the past uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and we wanted to see if there was a way that those, some of which we have been using historically, such as feminist and queer theology and disability theology. And it really surprised me when I was reflecting on this. We don't use, there is black theology um, as a separate discipline that we haven't approached and we haven't investigated and we haven't used as a, as a means to, not again, not as a means of appropriation, but as a means of expansion uh, to make sure that our material and our services are far more enriching. Uh, so that was the second aspect within worship. And then ultimately, of course, we just want to make sure that we have more people of color uh, leading in our pulpits, um, taking services, uh, full services, or perhaps coming in as speakers uh, for events or for worship um, to take the sermon or address slot. Um, so those three aspects, we hope, will you know, we'll be able to shift our worship away from being a very uh, white supremacist or white-centric focus to being more expansive. Uh, we also then began to look into the question of education and what we could what we could do within our religious education sphere, um, particularly levels of sort of reflective exploration. Um, you know, various RE courses uh, encourage people to look into their lives and to uh, usually sort of find, you know, find meaning and bolster from that. Uh, when you mentioned Leila Saad's uh, book, White Supremacy and Me, and that's one of our early initiatives we're hoping to start as early as next month, is a group discussion that engages with this book uh, which is set up as a 28-day course for uh, becoming aware of and exploring uh, white supremacist mm -hmm. markers within our own thoughts and our actions. Um, we already have a group, for instance, called Faith in Life, uh, where we explore, group, we explore questions uh, as a community, and that will be very uh, relatively easy to, to include at times questions uh, regarding race uh, issues and how uh, it affects our spiritual life as individuals and our community. But it need not just be sort of reflective exploration. We also wanted to look into it in terms of from an academic perspective. So we run, for instance, a un introduction to Unitarianism course, which includes a portion on history, uh, both the history of Unitarianism uh, as sort of large scale as possible, but also very specifically a history of Cross Street Chapel. Uh, it would only, it, it could only be helpful to expand that to include uh, you know, black figures within the within the chapels within the history both of the chapel and wider as well as um, you know finding out sort of less salient features uh, within our own history that need to be sort of explored and of which we 
then uh, are able to sort of push back in our contemporary space. And hopefully that, that greater knowledge, as we, I heard education, 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 uh, the more that I've learned and I've engaged with, the more that drive to do something and to actually foster actions is important. And one, of, one aspect is the, the level of outreach, um, going out and engaging with uh, groups that already exist, local groups. In Manchester, there's the Caribbean and African Health Network. Um, there's always an annual Manchester Carnival. Um, and as well, there's, of course, great sort of local campaigns. We've worked in the past with groups such as Shelter and the Muslim Education and Development Network. So it's, uh, it'll be important for us to be able to search out and find these groups for which we can uh, assist and help as best as we are able. Again, not in a level of trying to project onto them or take control, but of offering assistance um, as they may want us to. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn over to Adam. Yeah, and uh, like as, as Cody has said, um, good evening everyone by the way. Um, as Cody has said, as, as much as we want to be a chapel that engages in outreach to communities of colour, we also have to be careful to ensure that you know, we don't see communities of colour as an other to whom we reach out. Um, because we very much see the work of anti-racism as being done within the you know, within the congregation, and that it's as much um, it's a, as much about reaching into the con the congregation as it is reaching out from it to you know to the people um, of colour who are part of our congregation. Um, so an essential tool in achieving this is um, our structure of governance. So that's the the committee, um, and in writing the statement that we. Um, that we put out recently. Um, we were very much aware in the process of writing that collaboratively that we were a group of white men who were commenting on issues that were affecting black people, black women, black trans people, so people very much different to our um, backgrounds and we were, we were keenly aware of making sure that we were um, sensitive to those different groups. Um, and indeed the only minority group in our committee which is represented, possibly overrepresented, is gay men. Um, so, you know, we we acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do in making our committee more representative of the congregation as a whole. And um, when we put out our statement, I consulted on the statement with members of our congregation who, who are people of colour, um, members of the Unitarians UK group, um, and also a Black Lives Matter um, group that I'm part of on Facebook for a non-Unitarian perspective um, just to get some some feedback and it was generally well received that you know as a as a congregation that we were making this commitment um, but one at one point that came up for discussion and that we are going to be discussing as um, a committee was the idea that our, our committee doesn't represent at present the congregation as a whole um so one suggestion that that came up was the idea of um having you know, like representatives of different communities so in the process of we're in the process of reviewing our constitution and our um governance structures at cross street chapel um and there's the potential that we're discussing for having perhaps a women's officer role um, and a BAME role. And I, I do, I also take on board the problems that can arise from having um, what can be seen as labels for, you know, different groups or, you know, categorizing people as BAME can be prob problematic in itself. But possibly, you know, the, the idea that by having those positions as expected, you know, expected parts of our committee structure, we are then sending a message as a as a chapel that we are serious about getting the perspectives and the the experiences and the input from um like women or people of color um in our um in our committee so in the in the past we have like when we've done committee nominations we've had sort of opening statements to the nominations um saying that we you know we're looking to have a more diverse and more representative chapel committee um the, as our present committee shows that that hasn't worked so perhaps we need to take something that's a bit more um 
affirmative. So that's something that's going to be um, discussed as we go on with this process. Um, also, um, I just wanted to talk about the, the role of, in our committee or our governance structure, the role of technology that that has also played um, in being able to take part in like, events like tonight, like on, you know, on Zoom, Microsoft Teams, um, you know, the lockdown has really shown us that, that a lot of connection is possible and some, some, you know, some of our um, congregation members have actually found that they're, you know, they're more able to participate in, um, you know, chapel services and that sort of thing um, because, the, because of technology. So um, I know it doesn't specifically affect, you know, people of colour. Um, but it can, you know, have various impacts on, you know, like different intersections of disability, um, um, socioeconomic status, the like the hours that people work, um, so which can, which you know, have an increasing impact on people of colour. So recognising those intersections and holding our committee meetings um, in a more flexible way is a way that we can also. Um, you know, increased participation and representation. Um, and then also in terms of our history as a chapel, so Cross Street Chapel has a very long history um, and one um, initiative that we are also committing to is um, an, like a review of our archives with a focus on identifying um, historical documents and records of where so maybe certain dona donations have been received um, which are connected to um, slavery and the slave trade. So members of our congregation in like the 17th, uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, because of the ubiquity of slavery and the slave trade, that inevitably their money will have been tied up, even if they were, not, you know, not necessarily directly involved but their money or invest, investments which have benefited the chapel um, will have been connected to those trades. So we want to uncover those connections and we want to find some sort of way to recognise um, you know, recognize where that, that money has come from. So um, some suggestions that we've had so far is that perhaps the chapel could donate towards a reparations fund um, or make donations to charities and campaigns run by and for um, communities of colour, or possibly um, commissioning an artwork from an artist of colour to memorialise and commemorate the contributions from, from that um, era of our past. So that's where we're at with uh, our governance and our looking into the history of our chapel. Thank you so much. That's really um, impressive and uh, certainly some food for thought for us. Um, those of us involved with spiritual communities who may be able to do something similar. Um, so now we have a QA. and a um, I propose we, we have our Q&A for 15 minutes. I've, I've picked out five questions. Um, so hopefully that should be enough time to, to run through those five questions and sort of collapsed a couple of questions in, into one. Um, and then we'll have a brief wrap up after that. So we will go over, but hopefully not too, too long. Um, so oh, just to say at the top, um, I noticed in the chat um, a couple of, sort of suggestions, me and white supremacy, the book has already been mentioned and Gary mentioning um, sitting in limbo. Um, it may well be a good idea to collect together these resources. Um, I've helped to organise this event, so I'm not volunteering to do that. Um, but if other people would like to volunteer to um, to gather resources or set up a thread on Facebook or however you'd like to do it, then I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, and um, I'll be cheering you on as you do it, not me. Um, so let's move on to our questions. Um, there were quite a few questions around white privilege and recognising it. And um, could we have some examples of what white privilege is? Um, there was mention of the list of 50 different privileges. Um, and this question from Louise Reeve sort of uh, links to that. So have, have, we'd like some examples, but also Louise asks, 
Um, she says, when people hear the word racism or racist, they often automatically reply, I'm not racist, because they hear it as you are a bad person. How can we get past this impasse and engage with the complexity of a situation where some people are openly bigoted, some actively work to tackle racism, and some just don't think about it, but still benefit from a system which privileges some over others? So that's a general question of how we move forward um, when people don't necessarily recognise their privileges. Um, I'm going to start with Judy answering that, but maybe other people can chime in as well. Um, well, all, all those different, there were several questions amongst that. Mm. Um, uh, well, um, what I was thinking about was ways in which people benefit by, or how I benefit by being white. Um, I've got, I'm sort of looking at a list that I have here now. Um, I can get a job as a psychotherapist without somebody commenting on my colour and thinking that um, working, um, working cross-culturally is my natural place. Yeah, there's a tendency for people of colour um, for in the workplace, people thinking that uh, their particular interest is uh, about race not that they're interested in other, you know, any particular area, any other area. Um, I can speak English and therefore make myself understood internationally without having to learn another language. Um, I can see artifacts from around the world without having to leave my country because we've uh, taken a lot of artifacts from elsewhere and have them in our muse museums. <clears throat> Um, I can live my daily life without thinking I might starve or be attacked so that my life is in danger. I can live in the country of my birth without feeling I should be asserting a cultural difference. Um, I can meet someone I've previously contacted on email or the phone and they're not surprised by my colour when they see me. Um, so those are some of the differences that I came up with. I've got others in my book, but... Um, what were the other what was well it was about how how do we engage with people who don't recognize their privilege i suppose yeah. or have they don't recognize that there's a problem yes um i think i think it's very difficult to um suggest to people that there's underlying racism before they've done the the work of um um, of understanding there's a problem at all. Um, I've got a, 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 a white awareness um, model that takes one through a process towards becoming more white aware and um, that starts with um, trying to understand what the, what, what the difficulty is for black people. You know, that, that the, first of all, there's a sense of denial. There's no problem here. What on earth are they on about? They've got a chip on their shoulder, that kind of thing. To actually seeing that there is a problem here and that that, that, that um, attitude in itself is a problem. And so sort of, first of all, trying to understand that there is a problem. And then when you begin to realize the depth of that problem, there's often a feeling of guilt and um, there's one thing that black people don't want to hear about is white people's guilt you know like absolve me of this guilt so you know I'm actually a good person really um, but it is uh, the thing about guilt or feeling of feelings of guilt and shame is that they alert you to there's something amiss here and but that can take you into looking more into yourself. What is actually, um, uh, what is this? What is this racism in myself? So I think it's quite difficult to. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm going on too long. Thank you, Judy. Does anyone else want to come in with comments on this question? I can come in for a few. Mm. Um, I mean, I, f I think the most important thing is, is what Judy said. 
you have to do the work and research and there's quite a few books out there that will help you to understand more about privilege and um, recognize and help you to un unfold and recognize your own privilege um i did this exercise myself and and um i came out of a list of about 20 other privileges that i hold so some of the privileges that um, the book's name is being able to move into a nice neighbourhood without harassment or being, to make, being made feel unwelcomed or uncomfortable because of the colour of your skin. Um, being dismissed as intelligent and, uh, and deserve, uh, sorry, being dismissed as unintelligent and undeserving of a place at university or a job or a promotion because of the colour of your skin. Uh, being told that you're filling a job because of quota or affirmative action being told that you're taking away some white person's job or, or woman or place or man and um, that they deserve it more than you. These are all things that are commonly just spoken about when people's not realising actually that's a privilege um, that you have that um, people of colour and black people don't have. Um, there's some other ones about um, being forced to read literature that does not pertain to your own race or culture and never be able to question it or argue about reading other books. You know, that's a privilege. Um, being told that you should be grateful that you're here or have the same privileges when actually you don't. Um, being able to apply for a job and not worry about the, how your name is spelt or pronounced um, knowing that someone will get back to you. Um, lots of times people with unusual names don't get called back. My daughter is one of them until she uses her middle name, which is Irish, and then she gets called back. So these little things make a difference. It's just educating ourselves. Yes, yeah. educating ourselves to be aware of by looking, reading upon it, social media, books. There's plenty there. Thank you. I think that's, um, that's very helpful. Let's move on to our next question. Um, if I got the right... Here we go. Um, I think I want to start um, with Gary on this one and then move on to other people if they'd like to chime in. Um, how important is it to teach colonial history as well as black history? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, OK, so there's a common there's a common thought within the black community that we have this issue of a black history of being one month long and the oppressors have given us one month to talk about black history. But what is really important, black history is actually history. It's not black or white, it's actually history. And the more people can understand and get behind that and how to fit that into the correct context, it makes it easier. Colonial history happened. We're not saying to avoid it, but what we've got to do is give it the credit. And as you've said tonight, we have to be totally brutal and honest. We know what colonialism did. You know, we were, we're all fully aware of what it is, what it's done and what part it played in the issues we have today. So I don't think we should shy away from it. Um, something else that you mentioned as well, talking about it, we're talking about whiteness and looking at everything from a whiteness point of view. You know, one of the things that we have to do is really look at it from a black point of view. Because have you ever injured yourself and somebody said to you, oh, that doesn't really hurt, you're OK. And you think to yourself, no, it's actually really killing me. And they go, no, you'll be all right. That's the kind of issue when people say, oh, the race card or, you know, your history doesn't really count or, you know, we're looking at whiteness and like not worried about what blackness is. The examples that Winnie gave, every black person that you speak to will give you the exact things that she's listed tonight. And I'm not lying, if you don't believe me, go and ask people after we finish this call tonight. You go and ask them three things that Winnie pointed out and every black person will tell you. Every black person has been stopped by the police for reasons that they can't explain or stuff like that. Uh, there's actually a case, in fact, actually, just to give you the example, I like to give evidence. There's a case of a senior black banker from uh, London who was stopped um, two years ago, highly successful, six figure salary. His mum does well, his wife does well. He was stopped by the police under terrorism. Then it changed to like, oh, you're driving a nice car that you shouldn't be able to afford. And it turned into this long thing. Two and a half years later, he's still fighting it. Now, that's the sort of thing that some people will look at and think, oh, he's playing the race card. Or, you know, that's not looking back. But if you look back to colonialism, isn't that part of an artifact that even though all this time, 400 years, 70 years after the Windrush, 10 years ago, you know, we're still talking about things that are affecting the black community. 
So for me, sometimes it's not actually looking at it from a whiteness point of view, it's actually trying to understand it from a black person point of view. And the fact that these institutions that we talked about, the police, jobs, government, yeah, they really do have a profound effect on the community. So yes, I believe it should be taught. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if Margaret would like to come in on this since uh, we began with Margaret's story um, of, um, of lack of education around the slave trade. I wonder um, if Margaret, you have a brief comment on this. No? I think Margaret, you're on mute. You might have to unmute yourself. Ah, maybe not. Okay, well, let's move on in that case. Um, unless anyone else has um, a comment on the colonial history versus black history um, question. All right. Um, so next question. Um, some people are suggesting that white people should resign from leadership jobs to allow black people to take up these jobs. Do the speakers agree with this approach? Who'd like to take that one on? Yeah, you'll have to unmute yourself, I think, if you want to speak. Winnie, go ahead. Oh, God, <laughs> I'd love not to be the first. Um, I don't believe in people just having a job just because of the colour of their skin. Um, it's all, it's, I do believe in a meritocracy, in that the, the best qualified person for a job gets a job. The problem is, if you have a white person and a black person going for the job, what normally happens with systemic racism is that the white person gets the job even if the black person is equally qualified or even slightly more qualified. So it's not about having people resign and just replacing them with someone else. You have to have the right people for the right job who is qualified for it. It's opening the doors so that people of colour, um, of you know, black, white, Asian, everyone has the same opportunities to get through those doors. And you know, that doesn't just mean getting a job, but it also means educational opportunities coming up to it as well. So that's me. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Yes, Gary, um, I think you might have to unmute yourself. Or maybe we have to unmute you, Rory. Can oh, yeah. you help out? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quick pull, put forward again. Again, I'm just trying to give facts and documents for people to go and look at to actually back, back up what I'm saying. We talk about um, should people leave their jobs. Again, it's looking at it the other way around. The NHS, our lovely, beloved NHS at the moment, 2014 had to set up a specific organisation to look at why black people in the NHS weren't getting the same positions or jobs as white people, despite being in it from the very beginning. Uh, that was then added to or compounded by the fact that in 2019 they did a report and they found that most black people were being paid as much as 7 to 9% less than their white counterparts for doing the same job. So sometimes, again, you have to flip it. It's not the case that should people give up their jobs. Sometimes the people in those jobs shouldn't be there in the first place. And we need to be brutally honest about that. We all know that person at our workplace that's got a job and you're like, they're not really good at what they do, but somehow this, come on, am I honest? Wave your hands. Yes? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so I think we've just got to, again, flip it on its head and be brutally honest. You know, sometimes there are people who get jobs that really shouldn't be in those jobs, but sometimes it comes down to the colour of their skin. And again, the test is, the acid test, go and ask a black person if they've experienced this, and I'm sure, again, £20 on it, most of them will say exactly the same thing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gary. Let's move on to the next question, uh, which is, some, some people say racism is not as bad in the UK as in the US. How would speakers respond to that? Anyone want to go first? Judy? Oh, you can't unmute yourself. Let me try and unmute you. There's a problem. Rory, can you help out? Yeah, there me. you go, Judy. <laughs> um, well, I, I think um, 
it, I don't think this is a good question to engage with. We've got pretty bad racism, and which is worse is irrelevant, really. I don't think I don't think this is a good line to go down. Um, there's racism in both countries, and uh, maybe different um, ways in which they manifest, but. I don't think we should involve ourselves with that. We should just be looking at the at ourselves and considering that. I'm going to come in here as the chief, the chair, and and say that I think the question probably is, um, you know, provoking the response. Yes, we do have racism in the UK, and those people who think that we don't um, need to educate themselves. Um, does anyone else want to come in here on this one? Okay, let's move to our final question in that case. Uh, it's a, a slightly longer one. Here we go. Racism matters because it relates to how people, how power is expressed and used in ra uh, racialized society. But that is also shaped by gender and fundamentally by class. So shouldn't the relationship of white privilege to class be examined? especially as it is poorer white people who are often used as their foot soldiers by racist organisations. So a question around white privilege and class as well as white privilege and racism. Uh, who wants to respond? Gary? Go ahead, Gary, and then Judy. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, well, I don't even know where to start with that one. <laughs> um, can you just repeat the, the, the bottom sure. of the question again, sorry? Yeah. Um, shouldn't the relationship of white privilege to class mm. be examined, especially um, as it's poorer white people who are often used as the foot soldiers by racist organisations? Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure that I had heard properly, sorry. Um, I think this is similar to the question you just asked before and the answer you gave yourself. I don't think it's a matter where the racism is coming from or class. People try to break it down even further to distance themselves away from it. I think if we look at institutions, the class comes from the boardroom right the way down to foot soldiers, if you want to call them that. You know, and I think we just have to be brutally honest and tackle it as one. You know, when people start breaking it down into class, I mean, I don't understand how you break racism down into class. It's racism from the top to the bottom. Um, people talk about foot soldiers actually doing it, but I've experienced it from all angles and it's the same. Um, whether you go to, I mean, I don't know if you saw the story again, Eaton was talking about its first black student and how they actually created a systematic 50 year campaign against him because he wrote a book about his experiences. Mm. That's from one of our hallowed institutions in this country. So I don't, you can look at it from class and gender point of view, but I think it's really important to look at it as one structure um, one structural, i lost my words now, but one structural for, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Um, who else wants to come in on this? I will if you like. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, just to say that um, class is another um, issue that needs a lot of thinking about is, um, you know, but if we mix it with race, we say that um, it's the, you know that that, that um, if, we, if like I was saying when I was speaking, if people who who are working class say, um, well, I'm not privileged either. Um, well, that's also true, but it's not the same thing as um, white privilege, and that. You know, I think race has to be considered on its own, and it's often used as a way of um, uh, getting away from race. Mm. Get, you know, not really properly considering it. Mm. Thank you, Judy. I think Cody, did you want yeah. to come in here? I did. Um, it, yeah, it struck me as that um, as the sort the sort of quint I, and I I'm sorry if they didn't intend it this way, but it, I I heard it as that sort of well, we're not. You know, let's deal with you know, let's deal with class privilege, and then then we'll sort of manage, you know, white privilege. And it, uh, I've been reading uh, a lot of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and I know it's sort of an American 
you know, an American writer, so it's from that perspective, but it really struck me the, the number of instances that you have liberal individuals uh, seeking to better, you know, working class people or seeking, you know, women's suffrage and that all of these junctures in history, they end up sacrificing uh, black people and people of color for the sake of their own sort of end. So, you know, white women in the U.S. being uh, sort of given the right to vote in a sense that uh, instill the segregation that continued in the South, or the uh, you know the pro-union movements that sort of gave union rights for white majority you know industries that were white majority, whereas you know domestic uh, workers weren't allowed to unionize you know at the start of of the union movement, um, and it just you know it struck me as sort of unbearably sad that you know as liberal individuals were trying to be you know were trying to sort of engage with with everyone and try to better it, it, everyone but we get to these sort of positions where we're forced to choose and ultimately you make that choice mm. that have sacrificed people of color mm. thank you cody uh, winnie do you want to finish off this is our final question well, i just wanted to say that um we all have our prejudices and we all have discrimination happening to us it's not the same as racism like we said at the beginning with the definition um we could we could change the world where everyone gets the same pay, everyone has the same material things, every person has the same fault, but still, colour makes a difference. So, you know, racism does not equal, it doesn't take away from the things that other people are suffering in terms of class or gender or LGBT, but what if you're suffering all of that and racism? So just want to point out that we still, like Judy said, and from what Gary said and, and Cody said, we have to still with racism as well. And there's an intersection of it all, but racism really is a big topic on its own. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Gosh, well, um, yes, we're near, nearing the end now. And um, I mentioned earlier about our pastoral support team. Um, which we've put in place in case these deep discussions have brought up emotions for you. Um, they're going to be available for a phone conversation in the coming week. So I'm about to put up their um, email addresses on the screen so you can make a note of them. Um, and there'll be links also on the, on the Unitarian website. I should say though that we've intentionally chosen volunteers to serve different ethnic groups, um, the different ethnic groups in our gathering, um, which you'll see in a moment. Um, but basically we've used this model um, that is, a, a, the model is based on a process um, developed by our friends in the American Unitarian Universalist Association as they recognise that it can be easier to share with someone who may have similar experiences to yourself. Um, so this may sound a bit counterintuitive at this stage in our event um, when we're trying to build bridges of understanding, but it's precisely because we want people to feel comfortable about sharing on this difficult uh, topic and to feel that they are understood that we've adopted this model. Um, I should also say thank you to uh, Jen Sanders because she has offered to be our resource gatherer. So on this, um, get a pen and paper because on this um, document I'm about to um, share with you um, will be Jen's email address and also the email addresses of the pastoral volunteers. So, oh, have I got everyone? Oh, sorry, it's it's moved down. So basically, there's. Jennifer's um, email address and I will sort of move it up slightly so that you'll be able to see the pastoral team in full. There we go. Okay, so I don't know if you've seen, someone's just asked if you could uh, copy and paste it into the chat as well. I can certainly do that. Awesome. Thank you. 
Right, I'm going to stop sharing this screen, but as I said, um, the links will be up on the Unitarian website as well, I guess on the event page, along with the recording. So, um, now I'm going to hand over to, um, to Liz Slade, the Chief Officer of our um, General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches, um, to give us some closing words. Oh, we might need to unmute her. <laughs> thank you. Um, I just really want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been part of this, the speakers, the facilitators, everyone who's contributed to the discussion. Um, it's really been a great group effort. Um, I particularly want to say thank you to Rory for his expert um, tech hosting, um, and particularly to Kate and Winnie for initiating this conversation um, and for shaping it so thoughtfully. Um, and I'm really glad that the General Assembly can sort of add our support to this. Um, we've obviously covered a lot of ground very, very quickly this evening, and it's clear that this can't be the end of the conversation. Um, and it's, it's also clear that this isn't a topic that we can just pay lip service to, um, but we need to be doing the hard work to continue to open our eyes to the social reality that, that we're all in. Um, and it's clear that if we want racial inequality to change, then we need to change as well um, as individuals, as communities. Um, and I wanted to just quickly share just one line from James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which I'd recommend adding, being added to that list of resources. Um, but yeah, this, this really spoke to me when I read it the other day. In order to deal with the untapped and dormant force of the previously subjugated, in order to survive as a human moving moral weight in the world, America and all the Western nations will be forced to re-examine themselves and release themselves from many things that are now taken to be sacred and to discard nearly all the assumptions that have been used to justify their lives and their anguish and their crimes so long. Um, and it's, it's clear to me that this is personal work and it's collective work. You know, we know that we're stronger together when we take out action, but I think it also when we're doing this challenging inner work, um, it can help to be doing this together. So it's really great to see how many people um, joined this conversation this evening. So thank you all for being here. I'll hand back to you, Kate. Well, yes, thank you from me as well. When I first um, was thinking about this and how we respond to the anti-racism protests and with Windrush Day coming up, um, I never imagined it would be of this scale. So um, my thanks to everyone once again um, and to the General Assembly for helping to um, to promote it and to, to host this. And let's keep the work going. Let's keep educating ourselves and having these difficult conversations um, and keeping each other safe and well. So thank you everyone for coming and um, let's stay in touch. Thanks everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for having us.